I first met Danny and Linda Shelton back in the year 1986 when I first came to the United States of America. They are people of faith and courage. And the Carter Report was one of the first programs to be telecast on 3ABN. We've been with them without a break for about 12 years. And we've done some exciting things together, such as going to Russia for these enormous crusades, building churches, building a vast evangelistic center. And today we have with them a partnership in world evangelism. Danny Shelton is a man of faith, a man of courage. He's fully committed to the preaching of the gospel in the context of the three angels' messages to the people of the world. And I'm glad to introduce Danny now, who has a special message for us. Hi, I'm Danny Shelton, and I would like to just take a few minutes of your time, if I could, and to talk to you about some exciting things. Uh, Linda and I are apologetic that we couldn't be there this weekend in person, but we're going to do the next best thing, and that's to talk to you through television. And um, I want to talk to you, <clears throat> this is very unsolicited, Pastor Carter has no idea what I'm going to say. I appreciate that he's willing to uh, let this be shown in his church. But I want to talk to you for a few moments about John Beverly Carter. Uh, again, this is unsolicited, but it's something that's been on my heart. John and Beverly have been people that Linda and I look up to, we still look up to. We appreciate their dedication to ministry. We appreciate their... It seems like that the, no matter what happens, they continue to go forward and they continue to look up. I can't tell you how encouraging that is to people like Linda and me in a ministry as such as Three Angels Broadcasting Network to see people that are busy for God and they don't come down off the wall. They continue whatever's happening to them. They continue to go forward. And I have seen this couple. I have seen tremendous work around the world. I've been many times to Russia over the past several years. I've not only been to the meetings that John and Beverly held in Russia uh, on a number of occasions, but I've been there since, a uh, year later, two years later, and the results of the work of John and Beverly Carter through the power and the anointing, of course, of the Holy Spirit, I see the results in souls, hundreds, even thousands of converts, people who were communist, people who were atheist only a few short years ago, people who never dreamed they would accept Christ, now leading uh, Christ-centered lives, having accepted Jesus Christ because of the ministries of John and Beverly Carter. As workers for the church, we know that they're paid a salary just like any other pastor. What they do overseas is absolutely on their own. They, they raise all of their own money for evangelistic meetings, such as the one I wanted to talk to you about coming up at the end of January, the 1st of February, 1999, in just a, a few short weeks now. And to have these type of meetings in L.A. is tremendous. It takes a lot of money, and, but we serve a big God. And yet I've just felt comfortable and feel comfortable at this time just asking you to pray and ask the Holy Spirit what He would have you to do in support of the Carter Report Ministries as they undertake this tremendous evangelistic crusade there in the great city of Los Angeles, California. I, as I said before, I've seen the results of, of the Carter Report Ministries, and I will say from the bottom of my heart, uh, God has blessed Elder Carter and given him a gift and uh, he speaks with the anointing of the Holy Spirit like very few people in the day in which we live because I have seen the results of thousands and thousands and thousands of people. I have seen them night after night liter literally rush into doors, run to get their seats, sometimes elbowing and, and pushing other people because they want to be in there night after night after night. Uh, I don't have that that's something God hasn't equipped me with. I couldn't keep people in. It seemed like many times the people would come more and more. And, and when they asked for baptisms and people to accept Christ, literally thousands standing up. I expect this to happen in Los Angeles, California, because the same God that, that is working in Russia, has worked when Elder Carter's been in Africa, when he's over in the Philippines, wherever he might be, 
is the same God who's in charge, and he loves the people of the great city of Los Angeles, California, just as much as he does the people of the great nation of Russia. And therefore, because of their dedication and because of their hard work, because they're willing to do this, Linda and I have chosen to to join with them in this effort. We plan on showing these programs night after night after night, just like we did Net 98, and we want to show it live to satellite all across North and Central America and Europe and North Africa, expecting thousands will come to the knowledge of Christ and to his truths of the three angels' messages as presented by Elder John Carter. And I just again want to encourage you, each and every one of you, to really think about the times in which we're living. Think about the season in which we are right now. And we think about buying things for ourselves and our families, and we think about getting this for us and doing, you know, as a family. But, you know, our family, because of the Lord Jesus Christ, is, is, is not just, just one little family. We, everybody on this planet Earth right now is family. We're brothers and sisters. We're all in need of a Savior, and yet someone has to be willing to carry that torch, carry that light. Someone has to be willing to go forward. You know, you may not be able to preach like uh, a John Carter. You may not be able to sing like a Wintley Phipps or a Steve Darmody. You may not be able to do a lot of things. You say, well, I'm, I'm too old now. Some say I'm too young. Some say, well, I'm in, I'm, I'm in prison. I can't help. Others say, well, you know, I don't have an education. I can't do anything. But, you know, we all can pray. Every one of us can pray for these meetings, not for the success of John or Beverly or Danny or Linda or anyone else involved, but for the success of the Holy Spirit as it uses people as a channel of blessing, that it ministers to people and people will come to that knowledge and accept Jesus Christ. And I know this is going to happen. I'm convinced it is. That's why Linda and I have chose to be a part of this, to support it, to show it uh, through to virtually all the hundred downlink stations, through the many cable stations we're now on, and as I already said, across North and Central America and Europe and North Africa. You know, it's a privilege for us to do this because the, what Elder Carter is speaking of is directly from the Bible. It's an end times message for an end times people And the world is ready right now, more than ever before, to hear the truths of the three angels' messages. Many of you cannot go. You won't be able to go attend these meetings. You you can't do, you say, well, I can't do very much. But you can do two things. You can pray is the first thing you can do for the success of these meetings, for souls. And number two is to support financially. And I'm asking you to do it. We're not asking, we're not begging you for anything. Elder Carter wouldn't do that. I wouldn't do that. What we are asking you to do, and maybe I would beg you to do this, is pray and ask the Holy Spirit what He would have you to do. Instead of thinking so much, and I'm, I'm like all, we're all humans, uh, we all fail God, we're, we come short of the glory of God, but still yet we have a desire as Christians to see lost souls come to the kingdom of God. And I'm going to ask you to pray and ask the Holy Spirit, how can I help financially? How much should I give? I had a person just in the mail this week. Uh, I, it's, I get these letters so often, and I'm, I'm so in awe of the people and, and how the Holy Spirit impresses them. I got a letter this week. I just read it the other day, and there's an amount of $4,200. Someone said, this is our mortgage payment. It's on a business, I suppose. This is our mortgage payment. It's due this month. This is a sacrifice, tremendous sacrifice, because we don't have this mortgage payment, but the Lord impressed us of how important it was to send you this this, uh, money to your ministry, get this, that we're sending this mortgage payment right now in faith, and we want you to agree with us, they said, that God will replace that so we can make this mortgage payment. But we know the Holy Spirit impressed us to send you this amount and to send it now and by faith. You know, that takes faith to do that. I don't know that I could do that, and I, I, I hope that I could. I hope that I'm willing to, but right now I'm just asking you to do that. Pray and ask the Holy Spirit. Don't be impressed by this person or that person or, you know, whether it's me or John or anyone else. We're not trying to do that, but what I am trying to get you to do is say, Lord, what would you have me to do to help the Carter Report 
in these tremendous evangelistic, in this tremendous evangelistic outreach in the great city of Los Angeles, California. And whatever the Lord impresses you to do, whether it be great, whether it be small, you will be at peace with yourself. And we know that as people from around this nation uh, hear this, they watch this, they, they see what's going on, they begin to watch the results that they'll be supporting also. John has a tremendous amount of money to raise. We encourage you again through prayer. For those of you who can't give, continue to pray for the success of these ministries, that every need will be supplied, that the devil will not be able to stop these meetings. He will not be able to hinder them because of lack of funds. We found that as we go forward, the Lord surely does supply all of our need according to His riches and glory through Christ Jesus. Well, I want to thank you for allowing me to be this part of your church service. And I just want you, John and Beverly, and the entire church to know that we're praying for you. And Linda and I hope to come out, as I mentioned, in the first part of February to spend some time with you and join with you in this great evangelistic outreach for Christ. As Danny has told you, we are planning a vast evangelistic outreach right from here, from this very spot. And it's going to be broadcast virtually around the world live. There's a big question in the minds of some folks. And the question is simply, why? Why? I have four reasons, plain and simple. The first one, here it is, my friend. God has told us to do it. God has told us to do it. Please take your Bibles and turn with me, if you don't mind, to the words of Jesus in Matthew 28 and verse 18, to the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. Matthew chapter 28 and verse 18. And listen to the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. Matthew 28 and verse 18. Then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Listen, before we read the following verse, I want you to think of those words. Jesus said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Our authority, my friend, is found in Christ himself. He is the Lord of the universe and he's the Lord of this world. He is in charge. And he said, all authority, all power in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And then he said, therefore, notice, therefore, verse 19, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end end of the age this ought to settle it God said do it I love the saying of one old evangelist who would appeal to his people in this way God said it I believe it and that settles it my friend Jesus has said do it there are some who willingly try to stifle the preaching of the word of God and they have all sorts of reasons why the word of God should not be preached. My friend, God says, do it. It's the plainest and the most powerful of reasons. On one occasion, the great John Wesley, who is my hero, was preaching in some part of England and was brought before the bishop, the archbishop. And the archbishop said to him, why are you preaching here, Mr. Wesley? He said, you don't have authority from me to preach here. You see, Earthly human beings too often have tried to put themselves above the Lord God Almighty. And so the archbishop said, what authority have you to be here, Mr. Wesley? Go back to your own parish. And John Wesley said, my Lord Archbishop, my parish is the world. 
And we say to you today that our parish is the world and we are doing this because God said, do it. And there's a second reason I want you to notice. Not only has God told us to do it, God has called us to do it. God has called us to do it. Would you please come to the words of Jesus in John chapter 15 and verse 16, please? John chapter 15 and verse 16, once again to the words of our Lord. John 15 and verse 16, notice these words in Holy Scripture. Jesus said, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. Then the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. Jesus said, I chose you. And Jesus said, I appointed you, and I appointed you for a purpose, Jesus said, that you will go and preach my word, and that you will bear much fruit. The purpose of the church is to win souls for the glory of Jesus. So God said, do it, and Jesus said, I called you. God said to Jeremiah, before you were born, Before I formed you in the womb, I saw you and appointed you and chose you to be my servant and to be my prophet. Do you realize this, that before the stars were formed, before God even made the universe, God saw you in his mind and God elected you that you might be his servant. Before you were thought of, God thought of you. This is a comfort to me because my mother, while she was not a church girl when I was a baby, believed in God. She was a member of the great Church of England. And somebody has said the Church of England is the mother of us all because this is where we got the King James Version of the Bible and so forth. And my mother, who did not go to church, but who had faith in God, after I was born, she had a conviction come upon her. This young woman not going to church, this young woman who almost had an antipathy to a religious hierarchy, she had a burning conviction come into her soul that this baby boy that she had born was to be a preacher of the gospel and an evangelist. Why would she think this? And so as a tiny baby, she had me dedicated to God to be a preacher, a minister, and an evangelist. And I, of course, knew nothing about this. I knew nothing about this while I was a teenager. I knew nothing about this until after I'd gone to Avondale College and had decided to become a minister. But my mother recognized that I had been called to preach the word. And I had been called to preach the word. That gives me confidence to know that I should do what God God has called me to do, and my authority is in Christ, not in man. So we are running this campaign. Firstly, God told us, and God called us, and God has called every person here. Not only has God called me to preach the word, but every person who was born into the kingdom of God is born to be a missionary and to born, is born to shed abroad in this world the fragrance of of the love of Christ. All are called not to do the same work, but all are called to do something for God. Now there is a third reason why we are running these meetings here in Los Angeles and reaching out to the people of the world. Here it is. God, we say this humbly, but we say it with confidence. We say it with certainty. God has given to us in his infinite grace and mercy, a unique message that must be proclaimed. And in the words of one man, he said, I must and I will be heard. This message must and it will be heard. This is not an ordinary message. It is a unique revelation of truth. 
and it is a message that bears the anointing of the Holy Spirit and this message must and it will be heard. I want you to take your Bible and turn to the very heart and the essence of that message, dear people. Come with me to Revelation 14. Revelation, the last book in the Bible, Revelation 14. And notice for the sake of the context, verses 14 to 16. Revelation 14, verses 14 to 16, dear people. Where the Bible says, I looked and there before me was a white cloud. And seated on the cloud was one like a son of man with a crown of gold on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. Then another angel came out of the temple and called in a loud voice to him who was sitting on the cloud, Take your sickle and reap because the time to reap has come, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. So he who was seated on the cloud swung his sickle over the earth And the earth was harvested. This great apocalyptic chapter of divine revelation is in the immediate context of the coming of the man seated on the cloud who comes as the Lord of the harvest. This is in the context of the last days and the coming of Christ. And before this great event, this great climax of the ages takes place, before the consummation of all things, God in his infinite mercy and grace and wisdom sends to the dying inhabitants of this doomed planet a great message of love and redemption. That message I tell you today is a unique message that shall, that must that will be heard. And that is why we are conducting these meetings and that is why we are joining forces with the Three Angels Broadcasting Network to send this message around the world. Because God has told us to. Because God has chosen us to do so. And because God has given us a distinct message that you won't hear in every church, I tell you. Please notice the distinctive features of that message, dear hearts and gentle people. Revelation 14 and verse 6, here it starts. Then I saw another angel flying in midair, and he had the eternal gospel to proclaim to those who live on the earth, to every nation, tribe, language, and people. I want you to notice the word Everlasting, eternal gospel. There is only one true gospel, even though there are many counterfeits. The gospel we preach in this church, we say to the glory of God. And we do not say this presumptuously. We believe with all our hearts. It is the everlasting, the true gospel. It is not legalistic, neither is it antinomian. Now please allow me to explain. What do I mean it is not legalistic? We do not believe in a works righteousness. We do not believe in the Council of Trent that said, a man is saved by grace alone, through faith, plus the works of the Holy Spirit wrought in his heart. We do not believe that. That is a legalistic works righteousness we believe in the biblical teaching of grace alone through faith alone and that the evidence of that salvation is found in abundant works yes but they are not the means to salvation but are the fruitage of salvation grace alone through faith alone. The gospel we preach is not a false gospel. It is not based upon human attainment. It is based upon divine atonement. And in this church, we will uplift until we die. We will uplift the true gospel, not legalistic, neither antinomian. What do I mean by the term antinomian 
Well, of course, it comes from the, uh, the Greek, which means uh, the law, against the law. Nomos, the law. An antinomian is a person who would uh, suggest that he revels in the free grace of God while he willingly breaks the law of God. We do not preach in this church a gospel of cheap grace. I have here today a copy of Newsweek, November 2, 1998, which is entitled Sex, Sin, and Salvation. This, of course, is a very secular magazine, but the article contains a lot of truth. It says, to understand Clinton the president, you have to meet Bill the Baptist, a believer whose faith leaves plenty of license. And then it talks about the doctrine of cheap grace. It says, when the class of 1963 graduated from Hot Springs High School, the student chosen to give the benediction was a born-again Baptist named William Jefferson Clinton. Dear Lord, Clinton began, now we must prepare to live only by the guide of our own faith and character. Direct us to know and care what is right and wrong so that we will be victorious in this life and rewarded in the next. Now, 35 years later, Clinton's sense of right and wrong is very much the issue as he tries to atone both spiritually and politically for his sexual sins. In his latest step on the road to repentance, the president recently sent a letter to his Baptist church in Little Rock seeking the congregation's forgiveness. Acknowledging the letter, the Reverend Rex Horn said that Clinton expressed repentance for his action, sadness for the consequences of his sin on his family, friends and church family, and asked forgiveness from the membership. Making such a request is all the Southern Baptist tradition requires of sinners whose transgressions become public. But it probably is not enough to mollify his political opponents or the conservative leaders of the Southern Baptist Convention, some of whom have urged the president to resign his post. But Bill's, Bill Clinton's troubled personal life and his repeated verbal evasions also bear a distinctive Baptist stamp. Like most Baptist Clinton was taught that because he had been born again, his salvation is ensured. Sinning, even repeatedly, would not bar his soul from heaven. So there is a doctrine that, and I'm not here today to criticize the president. He doesn't need any more problems, certainly not from this Australian. But our highly esteemed president, along with millions and millions of highly esteemed American citizens, believe in a gospel and a wonderful gospel, but an antinomian gospel of cheap grace. It is a gospel that teaches people that because Jesus died for their sins, they can live like hell and go to heaven. It is the doctrine, once saved, always saved, once in grace, always in grace. It is opposed to the Word of God. And in this church, while we preach free grace, we do not preach antinomianism. Just recently I was talking to our a preacher, quite a well-known preacher, he said to me, I'm counting on once saved, always saved. He said, I plan to live like hell. He said, because the blood of Jesus has guaranteed my salvation. I say that doctrine is the abomination of desolation. And unless, my friend, there is a real change in the life, it is not the true gospel, it is the gospel that comes from the pit. You see, when a person is redeemed by the blood of Jesus, he is redeemed to live a life that reflects the glory of God. He is not redeemed to become a liar and to be evasive and to cheat and to steal. 
And one of the great problems I say to you today, my beloved American friends, is that so many people in this great country, so many of us are trusting not in the true gospel, uh, but they're trusting in an antinomian gospel and they believe that once they are saved and once they go to church, lying is in, stealing is in, anything is in. But I want to tell you, that may be in, but they won't be in when Jesus comes. And the gospel we plan to preach from this pulpit until the Lord takes us away is going to be the gospel of God's free grace, not a legalistic gospel and certainly not an antinomian gospel. This great land needs another statue. Over on the East Coast they have the Statue of Liberty. But over here, my friend, in California, we need another statue, the statue of responsibility. And I stand before you today and I tell you, we believe in a gospel that is a gospel that is full of grace and a gospel that is full of Christ, but a gospel, my friend, that upholds morality and truthfulness and ethics and a gospel of responsibility. You see, the Bible goes on to say that we're judgment bound. Would you notice the next verse? Revelation 14 verse 7. He said in a loud voice, fear God and give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea and the springs of water. We preach in this church a judgment hour message. Now our highly esteemed and beloved president of this country is being tried by the Judicial Committee and apparently he's going to be tried by Congress. I don't know how far it's going to go. Maybe it's going to go to the Senate. But I want to tell you, my friends, those courts are nothing compared to the court that is coming. You and I can be evasive and we can hire smart lawyers and we can argue over whether is, is, is. And what does is mean? Well, in this context, what is is? Is it is? But in the judgment of God, my friend, God will wipe away the lies. We preach a judgment hour message. And the Bible says, worship him who made heavens and earth, the sea and the fountains of water. We teach the doctrine of a God who made us. Therefore, man is a child of God. Did you hear recently about the man in the Ukraine who murdered 46 people? 46 people born and bred in the bosom of atheism and communism. And they said to him, why should you do this? He said, why not? And I ask you the question, why not? He said, I was taught that a man was a beast or an animal. He said, when I shot them, it was like shooting rabbits. Why not? Why is it there is so much crime in this country? Why so many young people with guns turning to crime? I will tell you because they have never been believers in the truth that God made us. And every child is of tremendous value in the sight of God. Every child, man, as one theologian said, is distinct and glorious because made in the image of God. And thus the relevance of the Sabbath A mighty bulwark against unbelief. The seventh day is the Sabbath. The Lord's day, I might say, not the Lord's hour. Some people believe in a Lord's hour when they go to church. That's because they don't understand the Bible. That's cheap grace. We believe in the Lord's day. We believe that the Sabbath is a mighty bulwark against infidelity. Did you know this? If the Russians had kept the Sabbath, there would never have been room for communism. And that country is in a dreadful mess today because that country turned away from God and turned away from the Sabbath. When the Holy Sabbath goes, everything else goes. And so we preach a full message, I tell you. Going to preach it loud. Verse 8 and onwards, the second angel followed and said, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great, which made all the nations drink the maddening wine of her adulteries. A third angel followed them and said in a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast in his image and receives his mark on the forehead or on the hand, he too will drink of the wine of God's fury. 
Verse 11. And the smoke of their torment rises forever and ever. There is no rest day or night for those who worship the beast and his image or for anyone who receives the mark of his name. This calls for patient endurance on the part of the saints who obey God's commandments and remain faithful to Jesus. These are distinctive and unique prophecies that unmask the Antichrist. Some of my timid friends have come to me and they've said, surely you wouldn't preach that on nationwide television, would you? I'd say, surely you wouldn't tell me not to, would you? Do you expect me to be a coward in the face of the enemy? Do you expect that I will be a traitor to the cause? And some say, but we shouldn't preach these things. Well, they may get us unpopular. Lord, have mercy upon those timid, time-serving souls who are more interested in their sustentation than they are in souls. Yes, we plan to preach it and wrap it up in the love of God, not attack personalities, but we plan to preach it because God tells us to. You see, our authority is not the church. Our authority is God told us, God called us, and God has given us a message. Our authority comes from Jesus, my friend. And we're going to preach also God's holy law. The Bible says, here is the patience of the saints. Here are those that keep the commandments of God. And in these last days, the law of God is to be magnified and exalted. What this nation needs to hear is the thunder again of Mount Sinai. So does Congress. So does the Senate. So does the President. So do you. And so do I. The thunders of Mount Sinai. Somebody said if God came down over North America and brought a message, God would say, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. You shall have no other gods before me. The whole lot of it, the law of God. Here's the fourth reason we are running these meetings. This message is the Elijah message. It says in the book of Malachi, before the end of time, God says, I will send you Elijah the prophet, and he shall turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. The Elijah message is a great get ready message. It is a restoration message. It is a call to repentance. It is a call that saves the family. The American family needs saving. The American family is under assault here in Hollywood. It is an assault, my friend, in Washington. It is assault. Um, it is being assaulted by the politicians. It is being assaulted by all those who break it down. And there you have four strong, strong reasons why we should run these meetings and preach the word of God from hearts that are on fire for God. Beverly, give me that book on poems. Let me read it to you. Let me read you why we're going to run these meetings. When I think about our homes, uh, I've got this little book on poems. This is the one I was going to share with Susie and Shondor, but I lost it, but I found it again. Here it is. It's a great poem. An old man traveling a lone highway came at the evening cold and gray to a chasm deep and wide. The old man crossed in the twilight dim for the sullen stream held no fears for him. But he turned when he reached the other side and built a bridge to span the tide. Old man, cried a fellow pilgrim near, you're wasting your strength with building here. Your journey will end with the ending day and you never again will pass this way. You've crossed the chasm deep and wide. Why build you a bridge at eventide? And the builder raised his old gray head. Good friend, on the path I've come, he said, there followed after me today a youth whose feet will pass this way. 
the stream which has been as naught to me to that fair-haired boy may a pitfall be. He too must cross in the twilight dim. Good friend, I'm building the bridge for him. These meetings are going to build a bridge. They're going to build a bridge for young people. They're going to preach a message and they're going to save thousands and thousands of souls across Europe, across North America, in Russia, across this great land of the United States of America. We believe also across my homeland. It's going to be carried live. Therefore, it is time for the people of God to pray. Therefore, it is time for the people of God to seek the Lord. Therefore, it is time to repent of our sins, mine, yours. Therefore, it is time to give our silver and our gold. Therefore, it is time to proclaim the message. Therefore, it is time to move ahead in faith. Amen. Please kneel. Our Father, our faith reaches out to you today. Here are great, compelling reasons from the Word of God why the Church of God must get on with the business of the gospel. Why we must get on with the Lord's business, not our own. Why we must lay aside lesser things and reach out to a perishing world. We pray today for our believers in Russia. We have baptized our Father, you know, more than 12,000. Many of them are on the point of starvation. Some of them are starving. And we seem so impotent. Oh, God, send aid so we can give them aid. We pray for this great campaign that's going to go from this place. You know the money that's got to be raised to advertise the meetings on the major stations here in Los Angeles. And even though our Father, humanly speaking, we stand alone, we're not alone because you're with us. And all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to your Son, and he's told us, go, therefore. And so we obey his word. He's told us, you haven't chosen me, I've chosen you. And because we are, cho we are chosen, we plan to go, Lord. We plan to go because you've given us a distinctive message and that message needs to be preached in the context of the true, true gospel wrapped up in the overflowing love of God. And also, Lord, here's another message. Here's another reason. It is the Elijah message that brings people together and brings children back to their parents, parents to their children. Oh, America needs that message. Bless this church. Bless Danny and Linda. Bless 3ABN as they join with us. Bless this congregation. Our Father, we thank you today that we're in the majority because you're with us. God is with us. All heaven is with us. All the angels are with us. And the money is already going to be supplied. Yes, God is supplying it. He's moving upon hearts. And God is going to do a work. And people are going to be saved. And people are going to walk the streets of glory because of these meetings. We worship you. We bless you. We thank you. And we praise you in the greatest name of all. The name of Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. For his sake, for his glory, amen and amen.